the presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Oakland Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 59. Regarding a murder, Patrolman William Kohler was found shot in the back a few moments ago. Suspects unknown. That's all. Tonight, Rio Grande makes a sensational new offer. A free gift for everyone who listens to Calling All Cars. Full details at the end of this program. Are you having trouble starting your car these cold mornings? Then try the fastest starting gasoline on the market, Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline. The cracking process loses extra energy atoms that flash into action at your first step on the starter. And then you've got power. More power than you need. Power that protects you against driving emergencies. That's what police car performance means. And that's why more police cars in California and Arizona use Rio Grande cracked gasoline than any other brand. Why don't you enjoy police car performance in your car? It costs no more. And remember, at the end of this program, Rio Grande offers you a gift. Three... And now, it is with great pleasure that we take you to San Francisco, where you will hear from Bodie Wallman, chief of the Oakland Police Department. Take it away, San Francisco. Good evening. Our case tonight directs your attention to the vital problem of juvenile delinquency, one of the most important forces with which police officers are to face. A large part of the crime prevention activities of your police departments is concerned with juvenile work to prevent potential criminals from becoming actual ones. Opposing this concerted effort of your police are powerful factors. First, the natural restlessness of the juvenile adolescent. Second, the present economic situation, which makes it almost impossible for the youth to find work when the lack of funds or of interest separates him from his high school or college studies. And third, the most important, the pernicious practice of a few industries in painting criminals as exciting, thrilling heroes. Where were the sympathies of the youth of the nation when the police of a score of states were hunting for John Dillinger? Who but Al Capone was the great American hero of prohibition? Too long have our police officers been considered annoying persons who curtailed your right to exceed the speed limit, burn rubbish at unlawful hours, or commit other simple misdemeanors. The policeman shares with the fireman the distinction of being the greatest hero in peacetime life. Daily he stands to give his life to protect yours. For this he receives a modest salary, and in the case of the supreme sacrifice, his widow receives a moderate pension. Beyond this reward he receives, more often than not, the criticism and ridicule by certain factors. It is for this reason that the police officers of the West Hail with such enthusiasm, calling all cars, which for more than a year has told the policeman's side of the story. Tonight, I am pleased to bring to you a story of two boys who worshipped well but not wisely at the shrine of the gangster. They set out to emulate their heroes. They conducted their, their career in true story book fashion, but they could not win. They, as every other criminal who tried to beat the game, discovered that crime does not pay. It 
It is the middle of June in 1931. School is out, and long, lazy vacation days stretch ahead for Sam Thompson and Ted Mason, two open high school boys. Lying on their backs under eucalyptus trees in the backyard, they discuss their summer plans. You know, Sam, we simply got to get down to the ROTC camp on the first. Mm, you're telling me. If we don't get through that summer course, we won't have as good a chance to get appointments to West Point next year. Well, I know that too, but how the heck are we going to get down there? My dad told me that business was shot and he couldn't give me any money for expenses. Yeah, I know. I got the same story at home too. Gee, forty dollars is a lot of money. Yeah. We could sell magazines or something. Well, before you sold enough magazines to get forty dollars, camp would be over and school would be started again. Yeah, that's right. See, I'd do anything to go to West Point. Anything? Sure. Boy, just think of it. Wearing those high shakos with the plumes on them and those uniforms with 21 gold buttons and, and marching across the parade ground in the afternoons with all the pretty girls standing on the side and looking at you. Boy, that's the life. Yeah. Gee, we got to get some money. You know, I've been thinking. You remember how Jaime Waters got his start? What do you mean? Well, he stacked up gas stations. Are you crazy, Sam? No, I was just thinking. Oh, I don't want to be no Jaime Waters. I want to go to West Point. Well, who said anything about becoming a beer baron? But we do need 40 bucks. Well, I'm not sticking up any gas station. Well, we wouldn't even have to do that. What would you do? Well, we could strip some cars and sell the stuff. That is not a Sam. I don't want to go to jail. Oh, no, it's easy. Gosh, do it like they do in the movies. You just pull up to a car on a dark street, unscrew the spotlight and the wind wings, and take the tire but off. But that's and... stealing. No, it isn't really. Guys that have a lot of junk on their car have it all insured. Heck, they just turn in a claim and the insurance company pays them. Well, it's stealing from the insurance company. No, it isn't. Oh, gee, the insurance companies have millions of dollars. And all we need is 40 bucks. Well, if you could figure it was sort of a loan. Sure you could. Maybe someday we could pay them back. Yeah, maybe we could. When we get to be captains in the Army, that'd make it all right, wouldn't it? Of course it would. How much money you got? Fifty cents. Oh, that isn't enough. We got to have a gun. A gun? What for? Well, for protection, of course. You can't go around stripping cars without protection. And then we got to rent a car. Why? For our getaway. Yeah, but that costs money. Well, if you can't get any dough, I know where I can, and I'll buy a gun. Well, where are you going to get the money? Oh, I know where Ma keeps her grocery money. I'll borrow some for a couple of days. And then here's what we'll do. We'll drive down the road. It is midnight of June 28th. Patrolman Hendrickson is cruising around his beat near the waterfront of Alameda when he sees two cars pulled up side by side at the foot of Pacific Avenue. Hendrickson stops his police car and crosses the street to investigate. Well, what's the matter, boy? You having a little trouble? Why, oh, yes. Yeah, my ignition's gone dead on me. Uh, ignition's gone dead, eh? Well, do you have to take off the spotlight to fix the ignition? Well, no, but you see, we were... Yes, I think I do. I see a couple of young punks out stripping cars. You better come along with me. No, no, we won't. Now, don't pull any gun on me. Oh, man, you shouldn't have. Oh, he ain't hurt. I just knocked oh. the wind out of him. That star saved his life. Oh. Now, listen, copper. Stick up yeah, your hands yeah. high. Get his gun, Ted. <clears throat> there you are. And his hands up. <clears throat> yeah. Now, snap his bracelet to him. <clears throat> All right, let's get out of here. <clears throat> man, you shouldn't have shot him. Oh, why not? If he'd taken us in, they'd make jailbirds out of us. Then we'd get thrown out of school and we'd never get to go to West Point. We gotta save our reputation. Yeah, I guess you're right. A few days later, Ted and Sam steal a car in Piedmont and go up to a secluded spot in the hills behind Oakland for some target practice. Boy, am I getting good. He hit the tree both times that time. Uh, you were pretty good the other night, the way you hit that cop right on the star. Yeah, well, it's a lucky thing for him that that star was in the way, or he'd be a dead copper. Yeah, and then you'd be a murderer. Yeah, well, I don't want to be a murderer, but well, we got to get good with these gats so we can get the draw first. Yeah. Ah, oh, you missed it by a mile. Uh, I guess I need a lot of practice. Well, we better get it some other time. We only got a gun full of shells left, and we'll need them for tonight. Okay, let's go. Yeah, I'll say it is. Hey, Sam. Hmm? Look at that car coming up here. Looks like a cop in it. Oh, it is a cop. Come on, let's get out of here. Just a minute, boys. What's the hurry? Oh, nothing. What are you doing up here? Nothing. Just looking at the view. Thought I heard some shooting up here, did you? Oh, no. Got your driver's license with you? Yes. Have a look at it. Oh, here you are. Mm-hmm. Where's your registration card? Why, 
Oh, I don't know. I Supposed to be on the steering post of the car. Yeah, I know. Who's the car registered to? Oh, I don't know that either. Well, I guess you kids better take a ride with me. Get out. Now, I'll just take a look at this license number. Can we make a break for it? He's got your right name. Well, let's give him the works. Oh, it's the only thing we can do. Think of our reputations. Okay. Let him have it. Come on, we got to get out of here. Wait a minute. i got to get that book and my license from him. But Sam, he's lying right in front of the car. We can't go ahead. Well, we're not going to back out. We'll run over him. Oh, gee, Sam. Get in and quit squawking. The wheels will clear him all right. You suppose we killed him? Oh, I don't know, but we better get out of town fast. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Fill her up at Rio Grande Cracked. Okay. How do you like this crack, mister? Okay, it gives me first-rate performance. That's what they all say. Well, for the love of people, you look at that kid running down the road. If he don't watch himself, he's going to take a nasty spill. Hey, mister. Hey, hey, there's a dead policeman off the road. What? Yeah, no kidding. He's lying right in the middle of the road up at the top of the hill. He's been shot. Okay, I'll call police headquarters right away. It is a matter of minutes before inspectors Bill Marshall and Eugene Murphy arrive at the scene of the crime. Mm. Bill Cora. Yeah, shot through the head. 25 years he's been on the force, and he has to wind up this way. Not a single witness, apparently. This will be a fine mess to unravel. He might have been hit by a stray shot from a hunter. No, not likely. Look here. Hey, he got one in the back, too. It doesn't make sense that two stray shots have hit him. And he's been murdered. Yeah, but by who? Why? That's the question. Well, let's figure this thing out. Road curves away less than 100 yards ahead and behind. You got a canyon over here to the right and a hill covered with trees to the left. So the job could be done without anyone seeing it. And a fine chance you'd have tracking anyone. The concrete road doesn't hold any marks, and neither would these pine needles and eucalyptus leaves to the side. All right. Uh, but wait a minute. Something funny about the position of his car here. It's uh, parked in the middle of the road. Wait until I measure that. About eight feet from the curb. And Kohler's lying with his feet a little ahead of the car and the body practically parallel to the curb. Meaning what? I don't know yet. And take a look at his gun, Marshal, while I give this turn the ones over. Well, there were two of them. How do you know? I just found 17 empty shells and all the leaves. And they were fired from two different guns. Look at the difference in these uh, firing pin marks. What were they doing over there? Target practice. There are four bullet holes in that tree in the center of the clearing. Mm. Four out of 17 at 25 feet. It's not very good shooting. Yeah. Yet they hit Bill Kohler at 50 feet. They didn't shoot him from there. How do you know? Well, why would he park out in the middle of the street eight feet from the curb? He must have stopped alongside another car, and they must have been in the or he'd have pulled up behind or in front. All right, suppose they were in the car, and he pulled up and questioned them. About what? I don't know, but he was suspicious of something. Yeah. He got some information he put down in his notebook. What was it? I don't know, because they took his notebook. He must have taken it to conceal whatever he wrote down. Yeah, but uh, why did he get out of his car? He wanted to take down their license number. You can tell that by where he was standing a few feet in front of the car. Yeah, but they uh, couldn't have shot from inside the car without breaking the windshield. Well, they must have got out. Well, what for? Well, let's suppose he ordered them out and was going to take them to the station in his car. He got out to take the license number and they let him have it. That sounds reasonable. One bullet hits Bill in the face, he uh, wheels around and starts to fall, and the other gets him in the back. Right. So then they jump in the car and drive away. But in which direction? Well, that's easy. Straight ahead. How do you figure that? Look at that black smudge on Bill's coat. Yeah? Automobile grease. Dirty, dried grease like you find on a crankcase housing. Meaning? Meaning they drove right over him and the grease rubbed off the crankcase onto his coat. You're a regular Philo Vance, aren't you? Uh, don't call me any dirty names. Oh, no offense. Philo Vance is a great detective in these here crime novels. Oh. Well, then, Hawkshaw, maybe you can tell me what kind of a car they drove. I think I can. Go ahead, I'm waiting. You see that pile of leaves? Yeah. The wheels went right over them, ground some of them to dust, and I marked the width of a Ford tire. The fresh track or the wind would blow it away. That's right. The wind's blowing the dust away this minute. That's okay. We're looking for a Ford with the crankcase grease wiped off. Come on, let's go. Yes, sir. 
From gasoline? Are you the man who called us about the murder up the road? Oh, yeah. You detectives? All right. Do uh, you remember the cars that have come down this canyon in the past hour or so? Yeah, I think I do. How many were there? Oh, about half a dozen. How about a Ford with two men in it going pretty fast? Yeah, I remember that car. A convertible Ford Coupe. Uh, what do they look like? Oh, a couple of young fellows. One had on a red sweater. They didn't wear any hats. Fine. Get a phone here? Yes, sir. Good. I'll give headquarters that description right away. <laughs> Oakland police calling all cars, attention all cars. A stolen car, a Ford Coupe. License 1H Henry 4197. 1 Henry 4197. This car may have been used by the murderers of patrolman William Kohler. That's all. The next day, the Ford Coupe... The only convertible reported stolen on the day of the murder is found parked at Fifth Avenue and 19th Street. Murphy and Marshall immediately investigate the car. Now I'll get a look under that crankcase. Uh, the street's awfully dirty. Watch your suit. Yeah, I don't care about that. I'm going to try to find out whether this is the car that those hoodlums used. Hey, Marshall. Yeah? It is. The crankcase is clean of grease and one strip down the middle. What a break. All right. The next thing is to get this car towed into headquarters and go over it for prints right away. <laughs> After photographers have gone over the car for fingerprints and Marshall checks the prints against his records, he reports to Captain Bodie Wallman. Well, Marshall, how do those prints stack up? They don't, Captain. We haven't let anyone on record with the same prints. Do the prints you found on the car match with those of the owner or his family? No, well, I checked that. Hmm, then the chances are our murderers have the record. That makes our job a little tougher. I've been checking the records also for recent crimes where two young men were involved. Find anything? Yeah. Remember Hendrickson over in Alameda being shot at the other night? Yeah, that's right. They were a couple of young fellows, weren't they? Yep. I'm going over to Alameda and have a talk with him. Patrolman Hendrickson recounts his skirmish with death to the officers. After hearing the details of the incident... Marshall hurries on to more pertinent information. What kind of a gun was it they stole from you? Uh, 38. Bill Kohler was killed with a 38. Mm. Maybe it was yours. You got any empty shells from your gun? Uh, yeah. I think there's some in this desk. Hmm. Yeah. Here's a couple of them. Uh-huh. It was the same gun. See the mark this firing pin made? Yeah. It left the same mark on the shells we found up in the hills where Bill was killed. What do those fellows look like? Well, one was medium height with dark curly hair. He was wearing a red sweater. The other was taller and had his hair slicked back. They were about uh, 17 or 18. Pretty young to be murderers. Oh, they weren't hard guys. Matter of fact, they were a little scared. What kind of a car were they driving? A Chrysler Coupe. Yeah, did you get the license number? Uh, I didn't have much time to get it, but I noticed it began with a 9F. Well, that'll do for a starter. Now I'll have to go over the hot sheet for the past week and see if any Chrysler with a number beginning 9F has been stolen. <laughs> Failing to find any Chrysler Coupes with the described license plate reported stolen, Marshall and Murphy direct their attention to the auto rental companies in Oakland. They visit 14 of them with no success. And then they enter the office of the U-Drive-It on 19th Street. Well, what can I do for you? Now, what kind of cars do you rent here? Fords and Chryslers. Mm. Do any of the license numbers on the Chryslers begin with 9F? All of them do. Why? Uh, we're from police headquarters, making a little investigation. Would your record show who rented these cars at any given time? Oh, yes. We take a complete record of name, address, age, and occupation of every customer. Oh, that's swell. Do you have a Chrysler Coupe out on June 28th? Well, now let me see. Yep, there were three of them. And the fellow we're looking for is about 17 or 18. Say, I remember him. Here's his name. Ted Mason, and he lives on California Street. He gave his occupation as a high school student. He wore a red sweater, as I remember it. That's the guy. Yeah, but how do you know he didn't give you a fake name and address? Well, I made me show him his driver's license. And because he was underage, I sent him home for a letter from his parents. And when he brought it, I called his mother back to make sure it was genuine. That's fine. Come on, Murphy. Now we're getting someplace. Yes? 
Yes? Is uh, Ted home? I know. He's gone to ROTC camp. Oh, I see. Where is the camp? Down at Monterey. Have you a picture of Ted? Well, why do you want a picture of him? Well, you see, ma'am, we're police officers. Police officers? Well, has Ted got into trouble? Well, I wouldn't say that, ma'am. He may not be involved at all, but we have to make sure. Well, I, I, I don't know if I should give you a picture. Well, that would be best. Is that a picture of him on the table? Yes. But... I'll have to take it with me. Oh, well, uh, I... Has Ted a friend, a pal, a little taller than he is? Where's his hair slicked back? Why, that'd be Sam Thompson. Now, if there's any trouble, he'd be the one you're looking for. He's a bad influence on Ted. I try to tell him to get a new friend, but he just won't listen to me. And Sam Thompson, huh? Where does he live? Just across the street in that gray house. Fine. We'll have a talk with his mother. Well, when can I have the picture back? Oh, sometime tomorrow, ma'am. We won't want it long. Oh, I do wish you'd tell me what's wrong. Nothing, ma'am. Nothing to get excited about. We're just making a routine investigation. Good day, Miss Mason. Good day. Poor dame. He'll just about kill her when she finds out her son's a murderer. And there's no doubt about it, he is. This picture tallies identically with Hendrickson's description. Hendrickson identifies the pictures of Sam and Ted obtained by the officers as his assailants and photographs comparisons of the firing pin marks on the shells found in the hills and the shells from Hendrickson's gun further identifies the boys as the killers. Marshall and Murphy journey to the ROTC camp at Monterey to place the young men under arrest but discover that they have not shown up at the camp at all. Circulars are printed carrying the pictures and descriptions of the youth, and these are sent all over the country. A week passes. The scene changes to the little town of Cedar City, Utah. It is noon, and the hot summer sun beats down in glimmering waves on the dusty main street. Two young men saunter along, carrying packs, eyeing the cars parked along the sidewalk. We've got to steal a car quick. You're telling me. If the tire hadn't blown out on the other car, we'd be a hundred miles further east. Do you suppose they're looking for us back in Oakland? No. How could they know we did it? Well, cops are pretty smart. No, they aren't. Gosh, we did everything just like the big shots do it. Changing cars and covering up tracks. See, I guess we're smarter than most crooks. Oh, heck. Our mothers think we're at camp. Don't you think we ought to go back there? No, I don't want to hang around home anymore. I'm beginning to like this life. We'll blaze our way across the country to Chicago. Then we can tie up with a mob of big shots where they appreciate good choppers. Gee, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Well, it beats going to West Point. Why, we'd be millionaires before we're 20. Yeah, that'd be swell. Hey, this car looks okay. Yeah, nice new Ford. And look, there's the keys in the ignition. Well, it's ours then. Pile in. Just a minute, boys. Not so fast. Ooh, what's the trouble? We ain't done nothing. Stick him up and get out of that car. We just got into rest. We've been hitchhiking from Los Angeles. Seems to me you fit the description of those kids that killed the officer down in Oakland. Oakland? Oh, we never been to Oakland. What's your name? Uh, Bob Graves. And yours? Johnny Fanning. Uh-uh. Keep those hands up. Now, we'll just see what else you got on your hips. Uh-huh. A nice 38. What do you carry this for? Well, hitchhiking's dangerous. You gotta have protection. Yeah. Both of you need protection, it seems. Two punks are toting a rod apiece. They sure start early these days. Well, there's nothing wrong with carrying a gun. We got permits down in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'll just bet you have. Let's see what else. Hmm. What's this slip of paper? Mm hmm. A receipt from the U Drive It Agency in Oakland made out to Sam Thompson. So your name's Bob Graves, eh? Well, well, you see, I just bought this suit second hand. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. Well, boys, I'll have to detain you until I wire Oakland about you. Well, there's no point to that. We haven't done anything. Say, but we're uh, heading for the telegraph office. Now, March. <laughs> Oakland instructs the marshal of Cedar City to hold the boys for murder. They are returned to the Bay City. And when tests have been completed on the guns found in their possession, they are brought before Captain Wallman. Well, boys, I suppose you know what you're charged with. Well, yes, but, but it isn't so, sir. We never shot anyone. 
We never been in Oakland before. You both deny your guilt? Yes, yes sir. sir. All right, then listen carefully to me. We know you're guilty. Your fingerprints, Mason, were found on the car which ran over Patrolman Colvin's body. You've been identified by Patrolman Hendrickson as the two car strippers who shot at him and stole his gun. Shells from his gun were found near the spot where Kohler was murdered. We've made test shots with the gun taken from you when you were arrested. The rifling marks on the bullets fired in these test shots and the rifling on the bullet taken from Kohler's body are identical. We'll bring this evidence into court and we'll most assuredly win our case. We'll send you to the penitentiary to hang. Now, do you still claim you're innocent? Gee, Ted, I didn't know cops were so smart. What are we going to do? There's only one thing we can do, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Well, boys? Well, we did it, sir. But we didn't mean to kill him. That is, we hoped he wouldn't die. I don't see how you ever found us. I thought cops were dumb. (laughs) A lot smarter men than you kids have thought the same thing. Boys, you can't win the game the way you're playing it. I sincerely feel sorry for you. It's too bad that you've had to learn your lesson the hard way. But laws are laws. Stick your finger in the fire and it'll get burned. Try stick-ups and murder, and as sure as the sun will rise tomorrow morning, you'll get caught. I guess you boys realize now that crime doesn't pay. Sam and Ted were charged with murder, assault with intent to kill and robbery. They pled guilty to murder, waived trial, and on September 18, 1931, appeared before Judge Fred B. Wood in the Superior Court. Because of the California law preventing the execution of minors, they were sentenced for life to San Quentin Penitentiary. The Rio Grande Oil Company offers a gift absolutely free of charge to you and to everyone who listens to Calling All Cars. We offer you a year's subscription to Calling All Cars News, a unique new publication devoted to true stories of police, crime, movies, and radio. Your first copy of Calling All Cars News is waiting for you at your nearest Rio Grande service station. Drive in and get your free copy. You are under no obligation to buy Rio Grande cracked gasoline. In this unusual new publication, you will read the truth about Clark Gable, a true story, The inside story of the ghetto kidnapping, an illustrated authentic article. What Warner Baxter thinks about women, written exclusively for Calling All Cars News. Unusual photographs of exciting news events of 1934. Last minute movie news with previews of the latest pictures in an honest theater guide. A list of radio programs you must not miss for January. Describing the best bets on the air, including a review of the crime cases to be broadcast this month on Calling All Cars. Get your free copy of this remarkable new publication tomorrow morning. Drive into the Rio Grande service station nearest you. Remember, you do not have to buy Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Just ask for your gift copy of Calling All Cars News, and your Rio Grande dealer will gladly give it to you. Oakland Police calling all cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 59 regarding a murder. Suspects in this case are now in custody, and that's all. Calling all cars is written and produced by William N. Robeson. <laughs>